morning, everybody. Thank you so much um, for dialing in. I can see people are still joining um, the webinar as I speak. Um, just before we start, I just want to invite everybody who's um, here to please just write in the chat where you are, who you are. And if you hit um, to panelists and attendees, then that will go to everybody that's here. So you can sort of start a, a bit of a conversation. Um, I'm Trisha Duffy, and it's my pleasure to be um, hosting this event this morning. Um, if you've done anything interesting this morning as well, you can put that in the chat just to get you sort of used to the idea of conversing with us in this rather bizarre um, and sterile environment that we find ourselves in doing uh, webinars. Good morning, everyone who's just uh, written in. Don't forget to select a panelist and attendees when you're when you're putting your notes in, in the chat. Um, I've been for a run this morning, got up very, very early, so I'm kind of raring to go. It probably feels a bit like lunchtime to me <laughs> now because I was very excited to get going this morning. Um, and um, as I say, we're going to start very, very shortly and hear from some fantastic speakers. But just before we do, I want to say a huge thank you to Albert's events partners. We run events throughout the year very, very regularly. I think we've got something like five events going on this week alone because Earth Day has become a very big focus for us. And but for the help of these organisations, we wouldn't be able to run them. So big thank you to Sergeant Disc, to Green Tomato Cars, to Good Energy, Camma, and to Location One. Um, and those organisations are all here to support our sector and they're helping on us on our journey to become more sustainable. So we will add some links to each of those organisations so that you can find out more about our partners there. As I mentioned, I'm Trisha Duffy. I'm chairing the session today. I've got some fantastic speakers with me who will introduce themselves in due course, but let's just have a wave to camera from each of them. Val Samra is from the BBC. He's a group um, commercial director. I've got John Enser, who's a partner at CMS, and the wonderful Helen Nordrup, who is um, director of commercial affairs for content at Sky. Very, very welcome. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you all in, in a moment. Um, I also really would love to gauge where you all are that are joining us this morning in terms of your journey on this agenda about do I need a carbon budget? Is it the a business of the commercial teams to worry about this? So um, Siobhan, if you can just put up our poll, we're gonna just gauge your thoughts um, first, first off. Um, is the climate agenda something that our commercial teams should be considering? Yes, we're critical to enabling the way forward. Yes, but I'm not sure why. Maybe you'll need to persuade me. No, it's a production and an editorial agenda, or I'm completely unsure. If you could add in your answer to that now, that would be amazing. I'm just going to um, do my own answer there. That's great. We'll see the results of that in just a sec. Dun, 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 dun. It's like the countdown now, we need a clock. <laughs> Have we got any results, Siobhan? Oh, fantastic, you're already converted. Okay, let's get into this. So a few people can't articulate why, brilliant. Okay, um, I'm gonna just share my screen now and take you through just a few little uh, fundamental climate facts before we get started, uh, because we do find that people joining our, um, our um, webinars like this come with various different levels of, um, of uh, knowledge. So what we want to do is try and make sure that we're all on the same page before we start this, um, this debate. So let me, first of all, just share my screen and pull up these slides, there we are. Do I need a carbon budget? This um, was taken from the ITV actually. Um, it was a screen bag from ITV coverage in January last year. So before the pandemic, before um, COVID was even a thing that we were talking about, the chief economist from um, the International Monetary Fund said that the biggest long-term threat to the world's economy was climate change. And unless action was taken now, there's a real and present danger. Um, in December last year, the CCC uh, advised government that uh, we needed to cut our emissions by 78% by two, uh, 2035. That was actually in the press yesterday, you might have seen that, it's been um, doing the circuit of the, the, the halls of Westminster this week. So that's becoming a really live agenda now. And that's a very, very aggressive target. Just to put that into further context, when they talk about a 78% uh, reduction in emissions, this is not just the act of policy makers and fuel types and technology Mo a lot of that is going to be as a, a consequence of personal change of individuals of citizens uk citizen in the uk and businesses in the uk so this is not just something that we can allow the policy makers to take care of ourselves every single individual is going to have to make a change 
And why do we need to do that? Well, you've all heard about 1.5 degrees, I'm sure. We have that sort of figure banded around all the time. That's 1.5 degrees warming over pre-industrial uh, levels. That is the number that we need to remain under in terms of global warming. It's a very, very important figure. Um, a few years ago, they talked about two degrees, but the scientific community have reduced that down to 1.5. And the reason why that is so important is because beyond 1.5, we potentially get into this tipping point. We can no longer get back the devastation of, of, of climate change. There's nothing we can do. It will, it will um, spiral out of control and be out of our hands. But despite knowing that we have this very hard um, figure to, to not surpass, uh, we are on a trajectory currently to hit 3.5 degrees. So if you add up all of the policies of every globe in the, in every nation in the globe, um, currently we are on a trajectory to, to, to achieve a global warming of 3.5 degrees. Um, the consequences of that are absolutely devastating. The consequences of 1.5 are pretty significant. We are already at 1.1 degrees. We're cutting this really, really fine. There's not much flex in the system here. So the need to act and the reason why the government have been so clear about moving to this 78% reduction in emissions is absolutely present. It's not just a thing that's going to happen later. It's happening to us right now. And this is why. Um, in 2030, the CCC articulated to us and the UN um, articulated to us exactly what this means and what we're going to have to do. We need to halve our emissions by 2030, halve them again by 2040 and hit net zero by 2050. These are very, very aggressive targets. And as you can see, 2035, 78%, that math's kind of squares, doesn't it, if you, uh, um, if you think about it. And obviously, our governments are kind of trying to be at the forefront of this as we are hosting COP this year and starting to engage in that. So you guys are all commercial affairs people, you're lawyers, you deal in the uh, business of mitigating risk as well as enabling opportunity. But I just wanna briefly talk about risk before we go any further. We all deal with risk every single day of our lives. Should I eat the piece of toast that has a bit of mold on the corner? Well, you know, I'll pick that off and uh, put it in the toaster and no one will notice the difference, especially if I'm feeding it to a child. Should I have that beer at the end of the night? I know I'm gonna hang have a hangover tomorrow, but it's a risk I'm willing to take. I really want the beer. Um, the COVID uh, crisis was a risk that we were informed of. We knew um, pretty certainly, actually, the, the, um, the World Health Authority had been telling us that uh, we were very, very likely to have a, uh, a global pandemic of the scale of COVID-19, and yet we had nothing in place to mitigate that. Do we step out into the road without looking? No, we don't. We judge our risk accordingly. Climate change and the impacts of climate change is a indisputed risk in that we know that the consequences we might know, not know exactly but we know that something significant will happen and that it does absolutely present a real um, and present danger. So when we think about how we measure risk in organisations as you all do I'm sure on a regular basis we think about likelihood and impact so eating that toast is actually an acceptable risk it's very very unlikely that I'm going to get food poisoning <laughs> and the impact whilst if I did get food poisoning would be pretty unpleasant for a day it's not the end of the world. Crossing the road, yeah, okay, the impact of that, very, very high. I'm probably gonna end up in hospital, but it's very unlikely because I do look each way before I go and the driver hopefully has got their wits about them as well. Uh, hangover the next morning from that extra beer. Yeah, do you know what? It's uh, very, very likely that I'm gonna have a hangover tomorrow, but the impact of it's pretty low. I'm willing to take that risk, I can, I can handle it. COVID-19, will there be a global pandemic? This was a known risk, an unacceptable risk. The likelihood was very, very high and the impact was extremely serious as we've seen played out. And then finally, here we have climate change. A very, very likely impact on all our businesses, all our livelihoods, every part of our industry and our personal um, uh, uh, circumstances as well and a very, very, very high impact, very high likelihood, very high impact. And yet it's not in our strategies, it's not in our contracts, it's not really um, factoring in a, in a lot of our, um, our work. So what does that mean for production businesses? Um, we've got to think about budget and adaptation. This is the way that the CCC talk about climate change as well. And in carbon budgets, we're talking about measurement, reducing, offsetting the rest and budgeting for that as standard. We've, we've got to do that as a matter of course now. That's can't be an option and we obviously need to start to support that within infrastructure change as well not just in uh, pr production budgets and then in terms of adaptation it's about scenario planning adjusting our strategies 
making changes or planning for them if you can't make them today and using the levers that you have available to you because everybody has levers available so it's about finding the one that you can you can um, use so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now and stop talking which I'm sure will be a massive uh, relief to you all and introduce our first guest thank you so much for being here um Val it's absolutely brilliant to, to have you along Val and I've worked together before he's my boss at the BBC so we know each other quite well um, and he's a group commercial director for the BBC currently um, please do introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your perspective on this issue certainly <clears throat> I'm not quite sure whether I'd eat the toast or not, Tricia. So um, <laughs> it looks a bit mouldy for me. Um, so um, uh, welcome all. I, I'm Val Samra. I'm the Group Commercial Director. Um, I've had a career in uh, in the industry for 30 years. I've been I've, um, I've done quite a lot of things. Um, managed quite a lot of change. So I'm going to give you a sense of my perspective, my experiences of 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 um, how to handle big change. Um, I've led, I led our, as, as the managing director of television, I led a lot of change for the BBC, uh, led, led the Out of London um, moves, um, was one of the architects of the iPlayer, launched a lot of businesses, ran some procurements, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so well, I, I, just to say a few things, I mean, I think for me, own the change, you know, regulators prompt change. Uh, they don't do change and when regulators um, try and do change it's usually a disaster so 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 important to just own the change the change is coming and is here and we need to uh, really embrace it and I, I would say certainly the on my experience so the content industry it's kind of multi-layered the value chain is multi-layered it's a very open freelancer industry so so it's not just about owning the change it's also about supporting the change people need to be led through this um, and having commissioned actually we, we commissioned albert uh, i commissioned albert <laughs> as the mt for tv I, i'm really really proud of actually of what's been uh, achieved by the industry as a whole and bafta uh, we clocked in short order uh, that if we really wanted to make a difference um, Albert needed to be an industry initiative, not just a BBC initiative. And, and, and BAFTA has done a fantastic work in becoming what I would call a convener and taking Albert across the industry and then taking the debate about sustainability to the next level. This is one part of it. So, so it's really important to kind of get the whole industry, I think, certainly if you're in the content business, on the same page. Um, and for me, what's important about these type of initiatives is to move from the to, from the what um, uh, into the how, and there's usually an important step in that journey, from my experience, that gets missed, and that's that's the buy-in, uh, and that's needed on a, on a on a number of different levels. You know, there's buy-in. No doubt, the industry buys into this change, and everybody's you know listened to and, and seen uh, Trisha's slides, and they're and they're compelling. Um, but but a consistent way of understanding what good looks like. That certainly is my experience um, and tools like Albert really help. And if we were to compare sustainability to something like diversity, you know, there's a whole range of views about diversity and what good looks like. I think what good looks like in, in, in sustainability broadly across the industry, we've got a kind of consensus. Um, and, and, and there's usually an important, for me, there's also an important step um, of of getting that buy-in uh, at a number of different levels um there needs to be a dialogue between the kind of buyers all of the buyers it's necessary to ensure that we've got a consistency so that these broadcasters and streamers broadly need to uh, take a view about what good looks like um because they're all interacting with producers talent production service providers and they generally want simplicity they're they're, they're on the they're on board they generally want simplicity and and so and now in our world that we're in in, in television certainly in content we have multi part you know multi-funded partners so so um it's very complex if you're a producer or a piece of talent to know what to do if you've got a number of different partners so what good looks like uh, and how it translates across um, broadcasters or streamers i feels to me really important and then there's a set of discussions. I mean, I, I, I having managed some of the change before the iPlayer implementing all of that, and, and actually one of the first things I think I was responsible for was 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 moving from SD to HD, and and that was a 
a, a, a infrastructural change and a, and, 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 a, and, a, and a sustainable change that we needed to see through over a number of years. And there, are, you know, you need practical plans for change. Um, so setting the targets at a macro level, um, having the right governance, having the right strategy, having the right risk understanding, having the right reporting, and, and, and ensuring that we've got that at a corporate level, a business unit level, I think those are important. I think that organizations do spend a lot of time on that. They spend sometimes too long on those things, but it is important. Um, and then setting targets or making change at a micro level is where you really get traction, um, and which, as I say, are multi-layered. And this is where the commercial teams um, come into their into their roles. They, they make a massive difference um, in, in success or failure. Um, and, and the multi-layered sort of comment is about, you know, there are some, some things are fairly simple, actually. When you're doing a major procurement, that is very different to commissioning decisions. Um, a major procurements, and I kind of led our play out procurement, um, you've got three or four big providers. It's not that difficult to uh, embed the sustainability discussions. Um, in, in content, in the content commissioning business, it's very, very different, very different. And, and um, certainly from my experience, a set of engagements with partners and representative bodies are, are re really useful just to get them on the same page. So we spend a lot of time with, whether it's packed or equity or writers uh, or even specific talent. You, you know, sometimes you can use their voice to help change. So yeah, you spend a lot of time to get them um, bought into what you're trying to achieve. I think that's a, an important step that sometimes uh, organizations miss. And then you get into the kind of commissioner training, taking a policy position sometimes on, on some issues, whether it's gone cost or risk. Um, and then they're kind of tracking the reporting and, and then adjustments as required. This is, you, you, you never hit on the, on, on the optimum solution at the beginning. So you do need to adjust uh, as required as you're making that change. And, and, and the final thing I would say, um, the final thing I would say um, is that you do need a champion, a, a real champion of change. And um, um, I'm gonna spare your blushes now, Tricia. I, I, I said that we commissioned uh, Albert, and, and I believed in it, by the way, but, um, and, and I supported it. Um, but equally, I drive a gas guzzler. I was, I'd been a huge hypocrite to be standing up saying it's, you know, being evangelical about it. I do plant a lot of trees, actually, by the way, a lot of trees. Um, but I do believe in it. But, we, but you need a champion in leadership, I think. That's, a, that's my learning point. You need a passionate champion, um, somebody who uh, can support, challenge, uh, search for solution, celebrate success, and, and, then, and then keep other leaders who are, who, are, who are also managing on the ground on board, you know, and I think that champion role, I think it's, it's, it's bigger than people kind of imagine at the operational level, it's, it's bigger than what people imagine. Um, and, and Tricia, you obviously played that when we were, when we, when we launched our work, um, but, but that's, that's, that's it, that's important. Thank you so much. I mean, we need many champions, <laughs> don't we? I think, and we need a kind of a whole, a whole crew of a crew of champions. Um, actually, just interesting what you were saying about talent there. I don't know if someone from the Albert team can put into the chat for me a link to the Green Rider campaign, which is something that Albert launched last year, which is something that you can provide to you know casting agents and um, uh, talent agents and casting directors and talent performers themselves, which enables them to ask for instead of bowls of green m and should they be of the, the caliber to be able to make such requests, um, something around sustainability instead. It looks at costumes, makeup, transport, um, energy etc so it's, it's just a really useful resource and it's freely available to everybody um, anyone who's just joined us you're very very welcome we've got more people coming on as we're speaking which is fantastic um, please do introduce yourself in the in the chat and if anyone has questions for any of our panelists please put them in the Q&A and we'll be um, coming to those at the end Thank you very much, Val. I'm going to introduce now our second speaker, John Enza. Um, I met John last year. I didn't, I didn't know him before um, at a uh, pro bono project that we both participated in for the Chancery Lane Project. And the Chancery Lane Project is an organisation that coalesces the power of the legal um, uh, uh, sector, if you like, to be able to set precedent and write 
uh, both contract and legislation for what for use globally to help um, to um, drive forward the sustainability agenda so he and I met there and we've um, crossed paths a lot of times since because uh, yeah. unfortunately for him I found him an excellent resource and very knowledgeable person that I can bring up and go what do you think about this um, so uh, I won't say any more about you John please do introduce yourself and um, we look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, Tricia. Um, very nice to meet you all. Um, I am John Enser. I am, uh, as Tricia said, I'm a partner at CMS, which is a firm, a law firm you may not have heard of, but I'm sure you will have heard of Olswang, uh, which is the firm that I was at, which is now part of CMS. So the full name of the firm is CMS Cameron McKenna Navarro Olswang LLP, but that's far too long for anyone, so we're just CMS. Um, and I'm going to start by saying that the, you know, agreeing with everything that Val said, which is that sustainability requires, you know, champions, enthusiasm, organization, and uh, changing in culture and mindset and change is really hard, but it's coming really almost whether you want to do it or not. So it's really important for businesses to embrace it and get out ahead. And I think the commercial teams and the commercial side of this need to think about how they are going to be engaged in those cultural changes. Um, I suspect a lot of you will not have heard of the rather dully named Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, um, but that's a body set up as sort of part of part of the initiative of the Bank of England and the Financial Stability Board in order to make sure that um, climate related risk was reflected in you know what people read about listed companies but it goes much wider than that and we are going to see every UK company and a whole bunch of other things um, be required to in the same way as in your accounts you have to report about how, how, how you know how is your management of other things you're going to be asked to enable stakeholders and people who pick up company accounts to understand how companies are dealing with climate related risks and responsibilities. You know, so, so if this is on your board's table, which it's going to be maybe next year, maybe the year after, it's going to be on your table because everyone really uh, will be will be part of it. So, you know, you're going to have to think about how it goes through in government. What, what are the, you know, you have to report on the strategy. What are the what are your company's strategies on uh, dealing with short, medium and long term climate risks? What's your impact? So you're going to have to address these issues. And obviously, organisations like Albert and also Judas Bicycle, which, uh, as Tricia said, I have a long relationship with. I provide legal advice to them. I sit on their board um, and um, they have been really successful in driving a culture of um, thinking about climate through the uh, voluntary, particularly uh, sort of arts council supported art sector. And that's been through a mixture of sort of passion and enthusiasm, but also um, there is now a mandatory engagement with climate as part of the core Arts Council funding process. So if you are receiving your core funding from the Arts Council, then you, 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 you are basically forced to engage with this. And, and that's gone from a box ticking exercise over the last number of years into a number of organizations and it's not just big organizations some very small arts organizations really uh grabbing the opportunity with both hands and, and the enthusiasm um and you know like like albert they have climate calculation tools they do training through the industry and and it's but 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 i think we are beginning to see that it, it almost becomes part of the initial conversation that you know, where you begin a project, as soon as you get a script, get a budget, you, you start thinking about, OK, wh what are the climate issues here? This is not just, oh, we've got to get Albert, Albert certification, let's go and tick a box, all the way down the supply chain. And you know, the, one of the things that, that 
you will find as you get into this and you know forgive me those of you who are very familiar with this which is which is in terms of reporting and things you're not only um, required to report on your own performance but actually also on how you're managing in terms of your supply chain so you know, as a law firm we sort of practice what we preach here so you know we are committed to doing net zero by 2025 we've signed up to science-based targets because there's a bunch of questions about what does net zero mean so if you do something science-based and validated by a proper organization that's good um, we get measured by cdp both on our own activity and on the supply chain so it, it gets to the stage you know Albert has green suppliers, you know, you need to get used to asking questions at every contract and procurement you do. Tell us about your supply chain in the same way as people now, you know, tell us about your diversity. You know, again, when I'm pitching for work, every, every, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, not I'm, I, I'm an old white guy, but you know, every panel review, every pitch we do, we're asked about diversity and we're now increasingly asked about sustainability. So you really need to engage it really in a deep level with your suppliers um that's probably enough for me for now trisha um, thank you very much i think it's really interesting reflecting on what val said about sort of you know this idea of the change is coming and we can be a real kind of critical linchpin to this and uh, i think sort of touching on the fact that you can wait for regulation to tell you how to do it or we can own it ourselves and uh, we're all agreed that it's much better when we own it ourselves but actually just listening to you expand on that john there's an opportunity here as well isn't there there is there's funding available it is a mandate but also a a possibility in terms of how our industry starts to shift and react and learn from the likes of uh, the arts council and what's already happened in other creative sectors um to kind of you know shore up your business in a way um uh, and be um incentivized to make some changes yeah absolutely and i think that diversity is a, diversity is a good parallel in many i mean in many ways it's not because it's a very different set of issues um but it's a good parallel in the, the sense that you know there are some obligations around um you know diversity but actually the, it, it's the companies themselves through Project Diamond and other initiatives that are really driving the change. The fact that Ofcom is marking everyone's homework is kind of not, not really the point here. It's, it's becoming you know, particularly demanded from the public, from employees. And I think, I think we are certainly seeing the same in relation to sustainability. When I'm when I'm hiring junior talent, they want to understand what our, our sustainability yeah. issue is. So, so actually organizations who have a good story on sustainability will find it easier to attract talent as well. So a really good question has come up actually, I'm gonna ask you now before I introduce um, Helen, uh, should there be a voluntary code? Should we have a voluntary code um, set by Ofcom that um, holds us all to account? Or are we comfortable with continuing to kind of forge this agenda ourselves without any form of regulation? Because obviously the diversity agenda does indeed sit in as part of the Comms Act now. Yeah, look, I, I, I'm, I'm torn by this. I think, I, I think we have some challenges with sort of imposing anything at an Ofcom level, partly because you know, the, a lot of the people who are involved in the sector in the UK are not necessarily regulated in the UK. So whether that's somebody like Netflix, who's doing a fantastic job in terms of driving climate, um, or, you know, plenty of other players, you know, sport is an area which, which is quite challenging. But there are lots of people who are not actually regulated here, but um, who, who are still, you know, involved in the value chain. So I'm not sure that an Ofcom-led uh, initiative is necessarily right but you know it may be the way to really galvanize the whole industry to move rapidly in one direction Val, Val is waving and I suspect he has something to add to this. Have a quick word on this and then I'm going to introduce Helen to talk about the success they've had at Sky. Val. <laughs> I, I, maybe I'll just be a bit more <laughs> clearer I just uh, I, I think it's a bad outcome if you get regulators oh I mean I think the job for a regulator is absolutely to prompt but these are complex kind of um, it, complex challenges to work through and opportunities to work through. And to be honest, the best people to work them through are the industry themselves. So I think it's when the regulator becomes more prescriptive, we end up going into that tick box 
world. And what we, excuse me, the pun, we want to make this sustainable, right? So we want to make sure that it's embedded. So I think, I think the, I think the industry coming together to, to come up with solutions feels to me the right way forward. And also you need to learn, you know, on the way, you, you know, you try a few things and if they're not quite right, you need to be able to maneuver into a different direction slightly, as long as you've got the end game in mind. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really valid point. Actually, that tees up Helen beautifully to take on the next part of this conversation, because obviously um, we've just seen, haven't we, from what I presented earlier about this kind of trajectory that we're on, the sort of things that we consider quite profound and innovative today will feel probably quite normal in five years. And so how do you keep ratcheting and organisations at the speed that an Ofcom can move, um, let's be honest, is probably not going to be able to keep up with the speed of change that we're going to have to see. Sky have been very, very public with the launch of Sky Zero. They've been at the forefront of driving this agenda in our industry. And we're so grateful to have Helen here to be able to sort of start to articulate how that's felt internally, I suppose, from um, a commercial role within a content organization, um, but also you know, how you're using some of those levers that are available to you in, in your role. So over to you, Helen, and then I'd love to open up to more questions. So anyone who's just joined us, please do feel free to put your questions in the Q&A as, as, we, as we go through. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Um, I have to admit that, um, I, I took I, I was happy to accept hoping that I would learn something so even though Sky is very vocal um, about this area and we have Sky Zero um, for those who don't know uh, Sky Zero is um, our, our commitment that all Sky original um, productions are now carbon neutral um, Sky sports have been made They've made significant progress with all Premier League football um, and the Anthony, Anthony Joshua fight, the pay for view, pay per view fight, um, being Albert certified. So sport are coming on board. Um, we're also starting work on um, Sky Sky Studios at Elstree. We're building a new studios there, which and our aim for that is to be the most sustainable TV and film production site in the world. It's a big ambition there. <laughs> Um, and we've already started to um, move our fleet. We have engineers um, who use vehicles. So we've already moved over 151 new plug-in hybrid engineer vans. Um, so, so part of what we do is television. There's much more to our business. Um, and Sky feel very passionately um, about, about the planet. Um, so um, from my point of view, I work in content. So I work with producers. So I do deal making with producers and my team support from a production point of view, um, working alongside those producers to bring original um, content to our customers. And we ask all our producers to work to the sustainable production principles um, and to complete the planet test, which is the new initiative. So we've got an expectation at Sky that productions progressively uh, cut their footprint. We've been working with Albert for some time and certification is, is very well known by the production community. So we're hoping now to sort of shift the mindset to reducing the carbon figure further each time. Um, so, so we've been a, a carbon neutral company since 2006. Um, so from 2019, all our Sky Originals um, who have completed the Albert footprint have been included in our uh, Sky carbon neutral status. Um, so the emissions that can't be avoided in production are offset by the purchase of verified carbon credits. Um, I think what, what's important for today is um, for me anyway, is to think about the culture, because having worked at Sky now for nearly nine years, I think culturally, um, it's, it's sort of threaded throughout everything we do at Sky, and it has a huge impact. And I think if we want to really see change, rapid change, I think culture is super, super important. Um, so uh, culture becomes even more important during times of change. And I think Val talked a little bit about that already. Um, what do I mean by culture? So, so culture is the sort of values that influence people. Um, and, and, and that means people's everyday decision making and everyday uh, behavior. So, so at Sky, our, our commitment to, to, 
to Sky Zero has been driven by the very, very top leadership, so Jeremy Derrick and his exec. So it's deeply embedded in the company across all our business areas. Um, so some of it's really obvious, and we've talked a little bit about that in production, but some of it's really subtle. And I think there's a there's a space for all those subtleties because it becomes normal. So it become it's normalizing um, behavior that you know a few years ago we might might think was quite niche. So and you don't really notice it so much at Sky when you're working in the office. Obviously, we haven't been in the office for a long time, but in our offices, you don't sort of notice it until people come and visit. And then they're sort of really sort of wowed by the culture around sustainability. So you, so you won't see you won't see any single use plastic. Obviously, um, you'll be met by a giant whale's tail sculpture, which has been made from um, uh, plastic that was found in the ocean. Um, and it's it's sort of our DNA now at Sky. And that's that's not happened overnight. Um, so for this group, I mean, it, it's wonderful to see you, you're, you're coming from all over the country, all over you know, different nations, and also from overseas. Um, so, so there's a there's a real group of influence here just in in this meeting today. Um, so, you know, we we do we can we can influence this. All of you have got have got the power to influence this. I, I you know I'd really encourage you to think about your influence in this conversation. Um, What's the, what's the opportunity in terms of risk and getting our creatives to consider risks? Well, another way to think about the risk is to think about, you know, the, the opportunity. Um, Sky is very vocal on the environment. Um, we see it as giving back. Um, it's also something that our customers really care about. So we're not alone in this. And um, across our sector, broadcasters, producers, we've all got the power to reach and interact with audiences. So. Um, in our roles, I think we can encourage creatives um, uh, to ask, you know, what's the what's the next game-changing piece of environmental storytelling? Where's it going to come from? Um, if if I was a, a producer, if I was working in the business role for a production company, I'd be saying there's an opportunity here. You know, what can we become famous for? There's a real appetite from uh, broadcasters. They want to see. Uh, creativity in this space. Um, the, the, there's a shift in terms of how we're storytelling. So some of, some of that subtlety I was talking about in culture, we're seeing that in our, we're tracking that now with the planet test. We're looking at how can storytelling be less sort of fear mongering, more encouraging. Um, so, so what can we learn from how we've thought about diversity it's interesting because for sky we're learning about diversity from what we've learned about our work in the environmental space we've been really successful focused on this space for many years we've seen real we've seen real change happen um, so we're we're sort of looking at that, that to help inform our decisions around diversity and inclusion um, so so the, the the parallels that both speakers have spoken about this a bit already uh, I would think, you know, a, a big, a big takeout from um, from the the Black Lives Matter movement last year was let's listen to others, let's let's find out from each other other people's stories, and and you know, BAFTA are leading on that. How do we find out the pieces of the story that we don't know? Well, we talk to someone, we read a book, we listen to a blog, we perhaps watch a film. So. I'd say we also need to be prepared to have those difficult conversations. Many of you on this um, web, web call will um, be very passionate about these issues. Um, and so it's getting brave, isn't it? It's getting brave with those people that maybe our bosses or our colleagues that aren't as passionate, that have a different agenda. And it's about sort of surfacing those um, more often. Um, and, you know, what what's really the challenge and reality of all this well i think the reality is that change is possible change is happening um the bus has already left the garage so let's let's get on board um so it's not always easy and sometimes it can feel too much too too much of a change we're running out of time um there's also a lot of anxiety um around this and i know that a lot of any anyone who knows uh teenagers or have teenagers in their life there's a lot of anxiety amongst that generation um, and I, I, I would just encourage you to think about you know taking action is a great counter to that anxiety 
happy. Um, and and you, you all have influence and you all have a voice. So I, I, I would just encourage you all to use it. Thank you so much. So many things you've just said that I want to pull, pick up on. Um, in the last couple of years, do you feel that um, when you want to raise the agenda of climate change and you were thinking about a negotiation or talking to a producer or talking to a creative team that you've sensed a change in their appetite to have that conversation because we're all so stretched in this industry aren't we and you know the moment anyone who's dealing with any kind of commercial or legal element of our industry what are the COVID protocols can I fly to my destination you know so much going on so much to think about do you sort of get tarnished as a fanatic if you try and raise climate change related to this or do you feel that there's been an attitude change no not at all in fact i think i think we're sort of widely known now at sky as being really passionate and and it, and it's kind of it's it's in our dna so when we're talking to producers they know it's expected um, many of them are hugely passionate about this area um, so it's a really sort of shared learning space so so we try and um, we try and supply our production so it's not just producers it's our entire supply chain that we're we're, we're talking about the environment with um, so so we can learn from each other so often we, we don't green light we don't green light a production without getting into this I mean we, we we have these conversations across all our content it's just it's just as important as the editorial aspects it's it's the budget what what how we, we, we it's a requirement it's a deliverable so yeah. it's sort of so embedded um it's kind of business as usual so yeah. what we're really interested in is um, you know that's the challenge it's like how do we bring how do we bring this how do we keep this debate going how do we keep it's it's more about sharing the responsibility we see it very much as a responsibility we we, we go into so many people's homes we want to take this message into those homes so we have to sort of keep a check on our own behavior um at, you know having said that you know I, I i thought it was great what what val said about the, the kind of car he drives I think this whole area is is one of those areas where we can preach and sin at the same time. Yeah. It's one of those things that we have to be kind of open about um, and say, you know, because because all change in the right direction is positive. I and, 100% uh, agree with that. I mean, the, you ha we talk a lot in Albert about owning your own hypocrite, because what's the alternative? <laughs> You're either a cynic or a hypocrite, right? So we, we, we didn't create the Industrial Revolution. We're not responsible for this. But we do our part to um, to deliver. I'm going to invite John and Val back, and we've got a really good question that's just um, come in. Um, oh, a lot of people agreeing with what you're saying as well, Helen. Really lovely comments coming in in the chat. Thank you, everybody, for um, putting your comments there. Um, I guess um, we, we, we've touched on kind of risk a little bit and, you know, the bus has left, left the station, do you either get on it or you don't, but also there's a real theme of opportunity and innovation here. Um, I'm just reflecting on, I watched with my teenage children, um, the Sky original Twist, the Oliver Twist remake. And one of the things that I thought was a very subtle, authentic way to get the climate agenda in there without even mentioning the C word was one of the characters who, is a flexitarian and meat, eats meat as a treat. And I just thought that was really subtle, very clever, really authentic to the character. Don't even need to go there to talk about doom and destruction. He just has his pizza with, you know, vegetarian pizza and it was very, very authentic. But how can um, the legal process or the commercial process within broadcasting help to support creative innovation? I mean, do you see that there's a tangible link there? I don't know whether, Bao, you might want to kind of um, um, talk about that person. Perhaps there's a question for all three of you. Yeah, um, I do. I do, because I think, I think it, it, the, the, um, certainly those that I've kind of led, they are in the front line having the conversations uh, generally um, about not only just promoting the agenda, but actually having the practical conversations about sort of the budget, the risks and all the rest of it, as Helen has articulated. So it's at different levels it, for me, it feels like. It's, it's if, if our um, commercial teams don't really believe that they, they, they don't have a belief behind it, then they won't have the conversation, even have the conversation. Um, and then I, I do think it's, um, I, I, it is a bit of a horses for courses really. And I think each individual areas and broadcasters need to take their own pace with this stuff the important thing is i think is what helen said is to have the conversation and know that you're making you're moving in the right direction 
And you will find then some partners, some suppliers, producers or talent are prepared to, uh, you know, they really feel strongly about it and they'll go faster than others. That's great. That's fine. It, you know, um, what you want to do to promote success. I always feel I always feel that if you've got great successful stories, you share them with the others. We are a herd mentality, by the way, in our uh, creative industries. We all follow, don't we? So as soon as, as, soon as there's, you know, 80% of people are moving in that direction, the naysayers are, can assure you, then suddenly go, oh God, we better get on with this. We're not going to get a commission. So there is a, there is a, there is a bit of that subtlety of, uh, of the engagement. Um, so it's a balancing, balancing, I think it's a balance between setting hard targets and compelling, but, but uh, um, alongside having a conversation um, with them. And we, we you know, on, so returnable series, for example, you, it's easy to do, I think. You can plot a progression. You can agree how you're going to become more sustainable over the next three series, example, yeah? And, and people will generally buy into that conversation. I think that it's really interesting. You're all sort of touching on culture. And in fact, um, Mary, thank you so much for your comment about um, small industries. It's not just the big companies, the big CMS partners and the BBCs and the skies that can have an influence here, but also tiny production companies, perhaps with very small footprints, who culturally can start to use their own lever. Everyone's got some lever that they can pull or push here, haven't they? Um, John, I don't know your experience of working with um, Julie's Bicycle, where they're obviously a huge breadth of scale in the, in the other creative sectors that you've been exposed to. Yeah, look, I, I, I think that's right. And it's it's not just the great big, you know, the, the National Theatre that will, that has invested a lot in thinking about climate, but it's, you know, a small theatre collective in Manchester is one of, you know, one of the real sort of champions of this. So the, these, the, there is absolutely nothing that says, you know, it has to be led by the big companies. But I think, I think in terms of the sort of league lawyers driving change, I think, I think the key is that, um, you know, law, lawyers are good at two things, two things. One is asking questions and challenging people. And the other is, finding solutions, particularly the sort of commercial lawyers that Val talks about in, in, in the business affairs team. They're all about finding solutions. How do we do this? You know, he, you know uh, and so when somebody comes in with a, say, we've got this great new location, you know, we found a location for this, here's a location license. If the lawyer can go, have you chosen this location? You know, what, what are the issues about accessibility? How, how, how is this location going to be used in a, in a carbon optimizing or, or you know, with the least damage to the environment? If, you, if, you, if, you, if you're actually able to begin the process almost at that stage, at, at the point somebody comes in the room and says, I, I need a piece of paper that deals with this, then, then that means that the next time the person's gonna have thought about that question before they come into the room, and therefore, that they're actually going to be start thinking about it when they're scouting for locations, and it's going to yeah. move into the mindset, and it's going to change the culture over time. I mean, I just just to chip in, um, Tricia, at, at our best in the commercial and business affairs and legal teams, um, we adapt to the situation, just exactly as John has said. If I'm honest, at our worst, we're mechanical. We just basically apply the same concern. We like we like consistency. So if you're a CR, if you're a commercial legal and business affairs person, I would advocate be the former, not be the latter, um, because the latter leads you to bureaucracy and process and doesn't really add much. And you're just beating beating people, or, you know, over the head with a stick. Now there's a bit of that, is a carrot and stick with these things, but I think as our best, we are. And um, a, a profession that can really adapt and, as John said, come up with solutions, but but adapt to the situation that you're you, that you've got ahead of you. And indeed, you know, you know how you adapt is both about what the content and the discussion is, but also is the scale of the company. So, so Helen having a conversation with Endemol Shine or whatever they call now Banerjee is very different to a single um, single kind of one man and a dog producer, right? It yeah, just and is, in terms of resources. For the small producer, for um, it's Mary who asked that question, might be more significant because they've got more control, haven't they? They may actually have a greater opportunity in the short term to do something quite meaningful and exciting than a big lumbering organisation that has a lot of um, uh, you know, infrastructure in place. It's very, very difficult to adapt and change. Um, I've had a question about a risk, which I would love to put to you because I think this is a really good way to articulate some of the risks that we're talking about. Um, 
I don't know which one of you wants to answer this question, but do we need to be prepared for contributors or contestants coming back to us about the unsustainable house build or the unsustainable holiday or the move to Australia? How do we protect ourselves? Here, I guess they're starting to talk about content, particularly features and factual content, which um, encourages people perhaps to make a very significant lifestyle choice or weigh up the pros and cons of that without including the climate agenda. Have we got a risk there with um, our contributors coming back to knock on our door? As, as, um... I think that I think there's a risk. I think there's a risk to the broadcaster. There's a risk, a sort of reputational risk. I don't think we've talked enough today probably about that because that's a real, I mean, reputational risk is something that lawyers deal with but commercial people take super super seriously so I think um I see I'm a big fan of lawyers I'd be lost without my legal team I think they're amazing and they're my right hand and I, I think they're sort of unsung heroes of a lot of this to be honest um so so I'd just like to just pick up just on the small production company point just really briefly first and say great ideas can come from anywhere and we are in the market for great ideas so just to say that you don't need to be a giant banerjee to come up with a great idea and sustainability it can come from anywhere so just to say that but also this this idea of risk i think we know we, we we live we live in the entertainment industry so we know how reputationals can be built and can be lost and the environment is a really important it's a really it's it's a heartfelt value it's more than just you know did somebody's house get lost in a bushfire it you know it it, it it's actually um something that we can't pre you know if we if we go out there saying this is something we care about and then we start commissioning loads of irresponsible programming i'm not suggesting that programming is responsible but we have to be really mindful of you know how many car shows can we make without featuring electric cars the, these things are filtering through and we're in we're in a period of change so we're not going to see an end to some of these programming but we will see change within those programs and if we don't I think reputationally there's a risk yeah there's a, a question coming here about what other sectors we can learn from. And now I've got a bit of a biased view that the television sector is really quite ahead of the game here because we have collaborated and kind of come together. But I don't know whether you think when you look at um, the legal profession as a whole and obviously our experience, John, with the Chancery Lane Project, are there other sectors that are really progressive in this um, field that we can look to and learn from? Um, it's difficult. Look, I think, I, I, I mean, I think the there's no obvious standout candidates for businesses that have massively transformed themselves. I mean, actually, surprisingly, the big energy companies are doing a, an extraordinary amount to, to, to re-engineer themselves. Um, and, and I'm actually also, I'm seeing somebody else commenting in the chat that says, you know, the finance sector, e ESG in, in, investing is becoming a, a firm requirement. Uh, I think that's true. I think I, I'm not sure whether it's industry led or whether it's consumer led. And I, and I think that comes back to the point that Helen just made in relation to to reputation, which is which is you know going back to that question before. I think that, you know, yes, you, you, you might well get a contributor saying, I can't believe how much money they spent flying me to uh, to, to to film a, a, a holiday program. But but actually the real reputational risk is that the audience begins to say, we're not going to tolerate this. And that um, the audience demands change. And, and you certainly need to be ahead of that. There's no good being, no good being, you know, the last TV broadcaster to show Miss World when, when the world has moved on from thinking that that is a good thing. You need, you need to be ahead of, the, ahead of the public curve on this and kind of go, okay, what is the different way of filming uh, this? What is the different way of dealing with, again, somebody made a comment about, about um, fast fashion. And fast fashion and, 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 and sort of consuming clothes is, is, is a huge issue you know, in public discourse. And, and actually, you know, I think, think the TV industry probably is a little bit behind some of the, some of the rapid thinking on that. But, you know, I know Albert's doing great stuff on that as well, but. Yeah. 
I'm very mindful of time. We've got three minutes left. Um, Christine, thank you so much for your question about working out a carbon budget. Yeah, every organization needs to work out their carbon budget. It's something that Albert can help you with as far as production is concerned, because we have a calculator that enables you to do that. Um, and you're welcome to get in, in touch with us sort of um, uh, directly for more advice. Um, if you are a small company, there's probably something you can do quite quick and easy um, with various tools that are available online. But also, yes, um, training someone up to do that would be very, very sensible, I think, going forward. For, for smaller organizations who don't have a massive CSR department in, in your team. Um, listen, we've got two minutes left and there's so much more that we could have talked to. We should have put two hours for this discussion because it's such a rich topic. I want to say a huge thank you to you all. Thank you very much, Helen. Your insights are absolutely fantastic. Um, Val, you've given us confidence because we can see that we've been so instrumental as part of the sector in delivering change before. And John, your expertise, just in terms of how we position ourselves with foots in all of those different camps um, creatively has been absolutely invaluable. And I'm so sorry, those people that ask questions that I haven't been able to get to because there was um, so many comments and, and bits and pieces coming through. Um, I was going to run the poll again, but I don't think I will because you were also unanimously. Um, I was hoping for this <laughs> big kind of payoff moment where only 5% saw it was valuable and by the end everyone did. But I think you were already converted before we joined. Um, so all that it remains for me to do is to thank once again our partners, um, Sergeant Disc, Green Tomato Cars, Good Energy, Camera and Location One. They are um, absolutely invaluable to us um, in allowing us to put all of these events. Um, don't forget to follow us on social media. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn at We Are Albert. We Are Albert, so are you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much, Val. And thank you very much, um, John. You have been absolutely fantastic. I'm sorry it wasn't longer. Oh, you follow us already. Thank you very much, those that are saying that in the chat. That's great. Um, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Hey guys, cheerio. Bye, thanks. Bye.